Good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Bailey, um, and I'm a senior technologist in the ATI Structures Manufacturing Materials team. And it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to this webinar, Joining Forces. So today, we'll be launching the ATI's Aerospace Joining Technology Strategy and Roadmap. Uh, this is something that we've been working on collaboratively between the ATI and TWI, following a con uh, an extensive consultation with industry over the past few months. So I'd like to talk you through our agenda today. Um, and uh, I'm going to start this morning by talking about our motivation for the joining strategy. After this, uh, my colleagues Rob uh, Scudamore and Gerald Gandra from TWI will take you through the importance of joining in aerospace and a bit more about how the strategy and the roadmap has been developed. We've then got the opportunity to hear from some of the stakeholders that were consulted. Um, so Richard March from Rolls-Royce and Andy Portsmore from GKN Aerospace will provide an overview of the importance of joining in their respective organizations. Finally, we'll wrap up the session this morning with a question and answers. Um, and you can uh, send us your questions through the Slido link that's provided on, on the webinar page here. So in terms of the motivation for uh, why uh, we created the joining strategy and roadmap, I first need to start at the top, uh, top level. So with reference to the ATI technology strategy, um, hopefully some of you were able to join us just over two weeks ago where we launched uh, the ATI's new aerospace technology strategy, Destination Zero. So this strategy sets out the ATI's vision for uh, um, aircraft technologies uh, looking forward to 2050 uh, and it's about how we meet the, the the net zero goals and how we uh, how aviation achieves achieves that net zero uh, targets so this strategy represents the core of the ATI program and it defines our priorities in terms of uh, technologies it sets out our objectives in terms of uh, you know, what we want to achieve and it, it also looks at how we quantify our impact so if you did miss the launch of this strategy, it's actually available now to download from our website and you can also catch up on the launching webinar uh, on our YouTube channel that's available. If we look at the ATI uh, aerospace strategy, it's broken down into three key roadmaps. So there's a roadmap for a zero carbon emission aircraft, uh, an ultra efficient aircraft and cross cutting enablers. So the zero carbon emission aircraft is a, effectively an aircraft that has zero emissions at tailpipe. So this would be the technologies required in, in this roadmap uh, would enable that zero emission uh, tailpipe aircraft. So this may be uh, an electric aircraft or it may be a hydrogen powered aircraft, whether that be through combustion or fuel cells. The other roadmap then, the ultra efficient aircraft roadmap are the technologies required to deliver the incremental improvements uh, uh, to a more conventionally fueled aircraft. So that whether it be that kerosene or sustainable aviation fuel, SAF. Um, so the examples of these technologies would include the high aspect ratio wings or ultra high bypass ratio engines, uh, which we are, uh, you know, you see these types of activities being funded within the ATI portfolio today. Finally, the third roadmap is the cross-cutting enablers technologies. So these are all the technologies that we require to enable us to be able to design, manufacture, uh, and, and support these aircraft in service. So the technologies in the cross-cutting roadmap span design and simulation capabilities, manufacturing process developments, and then the through life considerations about how we support the aircraft in service, and actually, and most importantly, how we deal with the aircraft at the end of its life. So why do we then need a joining strategy? So if we look at this, uh, the three roadmaps I just discussed, they're relatively high level in terms of the technology strands that we identify. And actually what we need to do is better understand the technologies that sit below this, that contribute to us achieving these, uh, these, um, these top level technology objectives. So for the zero carbon emission, if we look at some of the examples of technologies we identify on the roadmap, We've got the need to develop cryogenic fuel storage systems. We've got the next generation of landing systems, and we've got challenges around uh, multifunctional thermal management. For the ultra efficient aircraft, we've got to be able to manufacture these ultra high bypass ratio engines. We've also got considerations around more electric aircraft systems and the challenges in terms of the highly flexible high aspect ratio wings. 
when we look at the cross-cutting technologies, we have the next generation of design and analysis tools. We've got our considerations for material circularity, as I already mentioned, and the challenges around inspection and re repair. So all of these technologies, if we look at them and we go a level deeper, we'll see are enabled by advanced joining technologies. So if we have a joining technology strategy, we've got a better understanding of, of what we need to develop in terms of joining specifically, and that's key because these then enable us to be able to develop and achieve these higher level system and higher level technology strand objectives. So if we look at the purpose of the joining strategy, ultimately it's to help the ATI better understand the priorities of the UK aerospace sector with regards to these technologies. It will inform the ATI and it will enable us to be able to most effectively use our resources. So to understand the uh, the priorities from, from industry and be able to direct our resources and be sure that we're, we're funding the right priorities. It will also be available as a resource to the wider UK aerospace ecosystem and it's there as a guide in terms of the direction of the joining technologies um, and it's, it's, it's there giving you, uh, giving the industry, uh, giving the, the ecosystem that, that view, view of industry and, and the driving key driving factors. So finally, as I, as I sort of mentioned earlier, the joining technologies enable a broad range of um, aircraft technologies in the future. So the scope of the joining strategy is just as wide. And the strategy that we'll introduce today actually covers all uh, areas of aircraft disciplines. So that spans aerostructures, that spans propulsion, and that also spans uh, systems. So I'm now pleased to hand over to Rob Scudamore, who's from TWI, who's going to take you through the importance of joining in aerospace. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rob Scudamore, Associate Director and Group Manager of Advanced Manufacturing Technologies at TWI. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the importance of joining. Firstly, just to look into what exactly is joining. Now, this is a, um, a definition that we've used before in the past with strategic research agendas and um, uh, creating a bond of some description between materials or components to achieve a specific physical performance. So obviously that, that bond, that joint might be uh, uh, you know, um, approaching parent material strength or more, or it may be uh, looking to, to have a, a more subtle um, uh, performance. So there's three main areas, um, uh, thermal, where we, we're using heat um, to, to sort of fuse uh, the, um, the uh, materials together. Examples there include um, arcs, which is about three quarters of all welding globally in multi-sectors. Uh, also brazing, electron beam and other um, fusion and solid state techniques. Second one is chemical. This is where adhesives come in, where obviously we're, we're affecting a, a, a bond using a chemical reaction. And the third one, which is very pertinent to the aerospace sector, is uh, joining through mechanical means. So uh, screw joining, riveting, um, clinching, flanging, etc. OK, so why is joining important? Uh, so just some, some numbers in terms of the, the size and scope. Uh, so PwC have said that the civil and defence uh, sector in, t in 2020 was at 697 billion. Uh, ADS uh, said that it's about a sort of three quarter quarter split in terms of civil and defence. Uh, that gives uh, civil aerospace around 522 billion. If we then look at that for the for the UK sector, applying the same split, it's around 19 billion in 2021. So that's obviously a very significant um, uh, amount of money. Um, if we then look at, um, you know, how do we then uh, look at, you know, how, how much of that is actually joining itself? Um, it's an estimate has been, you know, around a third as AWS, you might say they're a bit biased, um, American Welding Society. Um, uh, so that would be a, a, at around 7 billion. But obviously, even if it's, it's slightly less than that, even if it's half that, it's still a significant amount of, of, of the sector and a significant uh, budget annually. Now, if you look at global supply chains and, and the way that um, uh, UK aerospace work, obviously a lot of the value is, is added uh, in the UK um, and, and hence you know, things may be sourced from around the world and then brought together and, and joined 
uh, welded, whatever assembled in the UK. Hence, uh, you know, a lot of the actual added value uh, in, in the UK is, for, is from joining processes. Um, and this then means that what you get is you get um, uh, joining you know, contributes to the stickiness in the UK, as they say, in terms of you know, keeping uh, you know, aeros the aerospace sector um, as buoyant in the UK as possible. So just why TWI? Why, why have we been asked to, to, to um, carry this out um, in partnership with, with the ATI? So not wanting to, to blow our own trumpet too much, but we are the, uh, the Welding Institute. We've been around since 1946. Uh, we are impartial, so we're not owned by anybody. We're membership-based uh, research and technology organization, similar to the Catapults. We do have a global reach, so we have uh, members in over 70 countries. Uh, and at one point, 17 of the top 22 aerospace companies were members of TWI. So, so we are cross-sectorial. We're looking at solving problems across sectors, but we do have significant presence in the aerospace sector. Um, and a part of that, we, we are um, involved in standards in, in welding and joining, testing and inspection, obviously related, um, uh, contributing to those, uh, those committees. And, and at a broader level, we, we're, we've been involved in, uh, in drawing strategic research agendas, roadmaps at national and European level involved in, um, uh, particularly in the joining sub platform to money future at, uh, at European level. So I'd like to, to now hand over to my colleague, uh, Jao Gandra for some more detail. Hello, Hello. good morning, everyone. My name is Juan Gandra and I'm a principal project leader at the Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Group at TWI. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. So, so I'll take this opportunity just to explain what our process was to develop the roadmap and summarize some of the key findings and also the priorities it sets. So this was ATI's very first roadmap specifically on joining processes. So we had to start by defining the scope and the objectives of this exercise. So some of the questions we asked ourselves were or included uh, what markets, uh, product areas, but also processes it should really cover, um, what time frame should it try to predict, and also what people in the UK could really contribute to this to this effort. Um, so after we established those goals, we, we started by really uh, contacting and interviewing a number of companies in the UK to really help us establish what the landscape is for, for the aerospace sector. And that mainly uh, allowed us to understand the, the market trends, but also the corporate drivers and map any current challenges and any uh, R&D topics already in mind. And, and the, the, at that stage, the idea was really to start coordinating and, and processing this information to really feed it into a structured road mapping process. So we then um, started the road mapping exercise itself, and that mainly took the shape of two workshops between the ATI and TWI, so combining experts from both sides. And that allowed us to create the first draft version. And uh, once we had that draft, we went back to the initial stakeholders that we consulted in the UK, just to understand if it was valid, if it could be improved. And we took that feedback really to issue the final version that we're presenting and launching today. So the present webinar is really the start of our dissemination uh, campaign, where we will basically uh, promote awareness and start really the, the national debate on how new technological capability can be uh, promoted and created and developed in the UK. So over the coming years, um, hopefully this strategy will allow, um, will allow to develop or, or be used to inform strategies within each stakeholder. But what we're really trying to understand and, and promote is that cooperation element so that people understand what is the national strategy and more easily we can combine efforts to make sure we work together to, to create that new capability, as we said. So um, in terms of scope, um, it became clear that the focus of the roadmap should really be manufacturing activities. Uh, we also decided to consider upstream and downstream activities like design, but also manufacturing repair. Um, in, terms of, in terms of scope, it became really important to make sure this roadmap was uh, aligned to the national target to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And this really set our visibility of the roadmap for just under 30 years. So um, based on the consultation, it was also evident that the main market shares that were really 
um, considering in this exercise include wide and narrow body, uh, significant activity in defense and also regional and business jets. And it became evident there are, there are some new markets appearing like the urban air mobility concepts that we'll talk about in the coming slides as well. In terms of technical disciplines, um, we, we mainly focused on airframe and propulsion, uh, but also other systems like landing gear and actuators. So trying to get the holistic view of aircraft technology. From a joining process perspective, we really had to be quite broad. So we considered uh, welding, but also mechanical fastening processes, adhesively bonding, uh, composite joining techniques, but also the associated uh, processes in the wider manufacturing route, like the automation, angles, but also the non-destructive testing, which is key for this sector. In terms of materials, big focus on metallic and composites, as you would imagine, but we also try to be broader than that and, and talk about ceramic technologies, but also polymers more broadly. Um, so in, in terms of the consultation itself, so we, we, we interviewed um, the, the leading aerospace companies in the UK. So that included OEM, but also and we really went for that wide market share. So in terms of uh, wide and narrow body, but also um, going for these emerging new uh, sec segments like urban air mobility. So the electrification uh, side of things. And um, we really required that these companies had representation, not just from technical experts, but also from senior management and commercial business and development. So. The idea was to really get that holistic view of what the strategy was within each company so that we could um, map out a coordination and, and really develop this uh, higher level roadmap for, 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 the, for the group of companies. Um, so key things were to understand market trends, business drivers, but R&D challenges and programs that are in progress and see how they could be combined. Um, so in total, we interviewed uh, 11 le leading organizations. We also extended the, the, the interviews to uh, RTO infrastructure and academic partners. Uh, this really equates to a collective of 35 people uh, based primarily in the UK, but also internationally. So in terms of the fr framework itself, we followed what's called the market pull approach. And that means that we really uh, established the links between market uh, but also the product side of things and the technology. So our roadmap, which you can consult from today, is structured in five layers. So the first layer uh, deals with market and business drivers. So we'll have things like the, the need to decarbonize air travel or make it more sustainable, for instance. Um, and th those market and business drivers really will set what the aircraft evolution should be for the future. So we really had to take in, uh, the input of ATI's top level strategy and also the, 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 res the findings from the Fly Zero working group. And this layer in, in our roadmap document expresses the ATI's anticipated evolution for future aircraft concepts. So we'll have things like electric aircraft, but also high hydrogen powered and the ultra high efficiency gas turbines. So once we have that timeline of product evolution in level two, we then start mapping out what technology building blocks need to be in place for those aircraft to be viable and possible. So this mainly includes elements of propulsion, but also structures and systems. Um, the, the fourth level is where we added most value and it's the most extensive area of the roadmap. So we where, whereby we list key technology enablers and challenges. So we, this is where we uh, brainstorm what joining technologies will be relevant for this, for this, uh, for the future of evolution uh, of the, the aircraft technology. And we basically also, so whenever possible, we include uh, suggestions of processes that can be relevant for those challenges. But there are some challenges where there isn't a clear consensus in the industry what, what could be done. But it's important to understand when that challenge will is likely to take place so that people can start working together to to a, a, to really attack it. The fifth layer is a supplementary section where we listed resources that will help all of the industrial stakeholders uh, develop the research that, that was identified above. So this includes things like funding, infrastructure building, and skills development. And what's really important uh, in, in the roadmap is that we established the links between the joining technologies, the aircraft building blocks, but also the aircraft concepts and the market trends. So this way, 
researchers and product developers can understand when they invest in a specific technology, what's actually the impact from a market perspective, which is very good to understand what the goals are at the end of the day when, when you develop these programs. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the roadmap is far too extensive to, to go in detail today. Um, so it is available online and we encourage people to start navigating through it and start really uh, getting some ideas of what the steps for the future will be. Um, we also, there will also be an executive summary um, uploaded onto the website so that people can get that background. But we very much encourage dialogue. So if you have any ideas, if you want any clarification, feel free to get in touch with myself, Matt, and Rob. And we did, this is the, exactly the point. So creating the roadmap is the first step of the journey, really. So we need to now um, implement it. And that is via cooperation that will be more effective. So in terms of going, just summarizing what the main findings of the roadmap were. So we grouped all of the priorities in what can be described as five main themes. So the big emphasis on propulsion, but also structures uh, from a product standpoint. But there's also uh, a lot of work that needs to be done on the automation, inspection, and repair side of things. So we'll go into a bit more detail in the coming slides. Um, so it, a clear priority um, at the ATI strategy is really how you can enable a greener propulsion for aircraft. And that has mainly three, three th themes. So battery, electric propulsion, hydrogen propulsion, and improving the efficiency of uh, hydrocarbon fuel gas turbines. And basically for each one of these challenges, there are specific joining research and development topics that we listed in the roadmap in a bit more detail. But just to summarize, so uh, ATI expects that uh, in the, some of the electric, new electric, fully electric aircraft will come into service from 2025. And um, that means that a lot of work needs to be done in terms of certifying joining technologies for battery uh, cell to cell, but also cell to bus power joining. Um, there's also work to be done in terms of how you fabricate these structural cases for the battery modules. Um, but also not just the energy storage side of things, but how you can improve the efficiency of electric motors. So trying to bring some of the experience from the automotive sector in the past decade as such and convert it into aerospace technology to some extent. Um, there's also a lot of work to be done in terms of improving the reliability of electrical connections to make sure that performance and, uh, re and durability is met. Um, and whenever we talk about battery technologies and electric motors, there's also uh, there's always a big element of thermal management devices that need to be fabricated. And there are some significant training challenges on that specific front. Um, there is a consensus in the industry that uh, to 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 for larger aircraft and to, for for higher passenger numbers, really hydrogen will be uh, the, the viable propulsion source, and that is fuel cell, but also the combustion of hydrogen and. Hydrogen imposes a significant challenge. Um, so we have to understand how these materials will behave when exposed to hydrogen, uh, especially because of the storing temperatures for liquid, um, but also trying to understand how the joints will perform. So it's not just the material properties of the raw materials, but also just understanding how the fabrication will behave. Um, in terms of fuel cell fabrication, there's substantial work to be done in sealing and assembly technologies. Um, the storage element of, 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 of the technology as, as well. So fabricating fuel tanks uh, for gaseous, but also liquid hydrogen storage. And how you can consolidate or integrate these tanks inside the, the airframe, really. So that will really trigger a discussion about new architectures and new, new, new ways of designing aircraft from, from scratch. Um, for storing liquid hydrogen, we need to consider cryogenic temperature regimes. So again, thermal management and, and, and ensuring that, that those considerations are considered at the design stage will be essential and significant joining uh, uh, fabrication elements will be in, included in that. So uh, there's also a, uh, an agreement in the industry that um, hydrocarbon fuels um, are here to stay, especially for the long haul flights. And, but there is also an idea that there are, uh, there is significant scope to improve the really the efficiency of these systems. So by um, 
mainly by increasing the temperatures of the combustion so that you can get additional thrust and improve your fuel efficiency. Um, so some of the topics that were identified are include the fabrication of near net shape elements like drums and blisks. So this is a, a ex existing technology, but it can be exploited further to get those gains. And also the joining of higher temperature materials for that reason, to, to get the higher combustion temperatures. Um, from a thermal management angle again, uh, so with, with higher temperature, that needs to be managed as well. So um, designers are also, or, or uh, a lot of manufacturers are also considering the introduction of sustainable aviation fuels to get that sustainability, uh, those sustainability targets met as well for this type of architecture. Um, in terms of assembly and structures, there are significant research topics already um, in, and in literature public on, on the advantages of some of these new technologies that are identified in the roadmap. So um, in just to summarize, some really popular R&D topics include just in reducing the lead time and improving the efficiency of mechanical fastening. So um, where possible, um, manufacturers also want to replace fasteners where possible in metallic assemblies to, to mainly reduce weight. But we also have added value in terms of how the structure will be loaded. If we shift from a riveted structure, for instance, to an integrally stiffened structure that is welded. Um, a really popular topic is Taylor Blank fabrication of large metallic structures. And that mainly means uh, diverting away or reducing the reliance on machining from solid. So uh, many components in aerospace are machined from solid plate or forgings. And if you use welding to fabricate preforms that encompass the envelope of the part more closely, you can save raw materials, but also the manufacturing costs involved with those. So there, there are economic advantage for, for this shift. Um, and and when, whenever we talk about tailoring, uh, tailored fabrication, it's also very important to be mindful of the potential enabled by additive manufactured. So we didn't cover additive manufacturing in this roadmap. It has a roadmap of its own, but we do... Uh, we did prioritize that there is a, a need to understand how AM parts will be integrated into the airframe and joining processes for that specific for that specific application will be needed. Um, joining is considered to be key in enabling further uptake of composite materials. So at the moment, the, the main alternative is to use uh, mechanical fastening, uh, but there is an aspiration in the sector to move away from fasteners and use direct bonding me uh, methods to join composite materials and also composite to metal. So uh, for technologies like adhesive bonding, but also co-bonding and co-curing really come into more of a, a, the spotlight as an option to eliminate the external fastener. Um, and it, what we found in the roadmap brainstorming sessions is that the, these all of these trends of having additional welded structures and additional uh, bonding and replacing fasteners need to be really balanced with a need to repair and a need to decommission at the end of life. So having the similar materials joined together or fully welded structures really makes it a bit more challenging in how you repair them and how you can disassemble because at present uh, aircraft are predominantly mechanically fastened so you can drill the fasteners away or remove them and you can remove uh, sections for repair offline or or even just repair, uh, replace entirely. Um, and if the structure is more consolidated and integral, this is more, it's a challenge. Well, there is a, an, an idea uh, in the industry that you can use material deposition techniques to recover damage, but also fill cracks. Um, but, and this is kind of the starting point, but there is a, a discussion in this sector at the moment on how this can be done in a clever way, because designers really need to design for the full length of, the, of, of life of the vehicles, and that includes how you disassemble it at the end. Um, so just to finalize, um, next slide, please. So um, automation and inspection are a, a really important topic. We can't stress this enough. Um, and here we kind of included uh, lessons from Industry 4.0 um, from the other sectors that have gone gone through this transformation in the past decade. Um, so some of the key topics that were identified include um, increasing the automation of processes, but also clamping, uh, assembly and inspection. Um, there's also a need to improve the reliability of inspection methods for interfacial, uh, interfacial joining methods. So that includes, for instance, adhesive bonding, 
Uh, that's one of the main reasons uh, manufacturers use this hybrid uh, joining method where you have adhesive with a fastener is because there, there are some limitations on how accurately you can inspect the joints and ensure that the adhesively bonded joints on it on their own are, are fit for purpose or, or with the right quality. So if you improve the inspection, you can actually r remove the redundancy in the structure and just use direct bonding methods. Um, there's also an aspiration to shift from offline to inline NDT, so going for, my, for that more continuous flow of parts in the manufacturing side. Um, as we gather data and really um, develop intelligent processes, there's really a um, an opportunity to use the adaptive control, so things like artificial intelligence to have software uh, packages or, or processes that can actually uh, prevent defects from being generated in the first place. So having that adaptive control and moving towards a zero approach, uh, zero defects approach. And finally, whenever, as we gather this data um, and for process monitoring, there's also a an opportunity to see if you can actually use it as the inspection itself. So as the quality assurance itself. So moving away from a hundred percent part inspection. So these were uh, just to summarize. So these were some of the main R and D priorities that uh, we expect people to invest on in the coming years. The roadmap has a lot of detail in terms of actual process and technology examples that can be solutions to some of these questions. Um, but at this stage, we'll really hand over to our colleague, Richard March is going to explain how some of these uh, efforts are already taking place at Rolls-Royce. Thank you. Thank you, Zhao, and good morning, everyone. I'm Richard March, and I'm the process lead for welding and joining at Rolls-Royce. I'm going to take a few minutes to explain why ATI programs are so important to Rolls-Royce, uh, as well as explaining a few of the challenges that, that we currently face. Um, this slide shows some recent ATI programs that have really enabled Rolls-Royce to stay at the forefront of joining technology. So starting with Kajor, this project is developing and validating joining processes for the latest nickel alloy. Uh, as Jao mentioned, gas turbine temperatures are continually increasing to improve fuel efficiency, and this makes a lot of demands on the, um, on the materials that they're made from. And modern high temperature nickel alloys are very complex. They can't be joined by conventional welding methods, so we're developing a friction welding process that will join components without melting the material or compromising strength. Moving on to Autotig, this was another vital ATI program. Uh, tungsten inert gas or TIG welding is the most widely used welding process in Rolls-Royce, but it has never been fully automated. The Autotig pro uh, project really laid the foundation for the next generation of automated self-correcting self welding processes. Uh, and from that, we're going to see significant improvements in both reliability and productivity. So now looking at reinstate, this was um, a semi-automated adaptive system uh, that was designed to enable repair of complex components. In many cases, a used component is, is discarded, even though 90% of it or, or even more is in perfectly good condition. Reinstate will allow more of these components to be repaired and reused. And these are just a, a few of the examples of ATI programs that have really have brought a lot of benefits. In particular, working with different end users and different research organizations brings different ideas in and, and different experiences. Costs are shared across several users, and, and really, in most cases, we couldn't have afforded to fund the entire program alone. So this slide shows some of the enormous changes that we're now seeing in aerospace propulsion. And these are probably the biggest changes since the, since the introduction of the, gas, of the jet engine in the 1940s. Rolls-Royce is working on electrical propulsion and on new fuels, such as sustainable aviation fuel or SAF, as well as hydrogen. These require new materials and new methods of joining and the, the operating conditions of these new propulsion methods can be very difficult, as I say, very different, particularly from gas turbines. For example, hydrogen storage presents many problems, including the embrittlement of some materials. Now, again, as Jao mentioned, gas turbines are going to be around for many years yet, particularly for long haul flight. But the next generation of gas turbines will use new architecture and new materials in order to improve fuel efficiency. So these changes I've just talked about um, are going to bring a lot of manufacturing and joining challenges. 
For example, electric propulsion requires thousands of battery terminals to be joined, and every one of these needs to be a high quality joint. Furthermore, these thousands of joints have got to be made very quickly and very, efficient, very efficiently in order to produce a competitive product. Changes to our products are responsible for some of our joining challenges. Others come from the need to remain globally competitive and from reducing the environmental impact of manufacturing. Digital manufacturing and automation are particularly important for, for improving productivity, and we often talk about cyber-physical joining, where digital manufacturing is actually an integral part of the joining process. For example, a, a gas turbine contains over a thousand bolts. Every one of these needs to be set to exactly the right torque. In addition, we need to be able to guarantee and to demonstrate that every bolt is at the correct torque. Now, intelligent torque tightening uses a digital manufacturing approach to do this reliably and quickly. And then finally, uh, we need to make manufacturing more sustainable. So as well as reducing emissions, we're developing new processes to improve fly to buy ratios uh, and also to enable greater use of repaired components. So thank you, very, thank you very much for your attention. I'll now hand you over to Andy Portsmore. Thank you. Yes, my name is uh, Andy Portsmore, Technology Director um, for Assembly Systems at GKN Aerospace. So first of all, I'll just give a, a brief sort of introduction to the company and I'll reference this later. So we're a large company existing across three business lines, civil engines and defense. I reside in the civil um, area and so my, my key focus is in there. But I can tell you that um, the strategy as a whole uh, not only resonates but aligns very well with our own strategies um, across the three areas. In terms of GKN Aerospace in numbers, um, we, we've turned over 2.5 billion recently across 38 sites and in 12 countries and I'll come back to that, it's quite important with respect to the joining strategy. It's really the, the fact that we have the opportunity to put work in, in other countries at uh, lower cost rates should there not be a differentiator um, or a, a decommoditizing factor associated with, with joining. But it is certainly our, our, our strategy to try to retain high value assemblies in the UK. So first of all, I'll go through some, some key points. Um, I canvassed some, some opinions of, of my colleagues and put them together with my own to come up with a, a bit of a synopsis of key points on joining. So first of all, assembly joining processes typically make up about half of all labor hours for complex assemblies. There are, in addition to that, um, extensive joining processes which make up a significant proportion of the content in detailed component manufacture. So be that some sort of metallic substructure or, or integrated composite, depending on how you define the, the joining process, but certainly going on aligned definitions with what you've heard already today. Joining processes are also fundamental with respect to opportunities for improved recyclability and reuse, which is a point that I know has already been picked up, but um, I'll just build on that a little bit more. So GKN are looking to, to both optimize legacy and develop new processes. So in other words, look at taking cost out of existing um, processes and also um, look to develop new processes that can give us some um, additional um, competitive advantage on new products. So legacy op optimization is essential to avoid the decommoditization de of such processes, and loss of business overseas. And, and that really just builds on the point that even without losing business out of GK, and we do have the option to put business elsewhere, should it be more cost effective and, and we'll do so. So I think the key here is that we can develop processes that overall are actually cheaper, even if performed in the UK versus lower cost economy, uh, lower cost economies, so lower cost hourly rate economies. New process development is essential as well to bring new assembly opportunities to the UK. And what I mean by that is new market opportunities. So uh, new novel ways of joining are essential to that story as well. So uh, what are the key challenges then? Um, weight reduction, so nothing new there really. It's, it's been in, in our strategy for, as long as we've been a business in aerospace, um, but weight reduction through joining it is a key thing. Recyclability is, is something that is obviously gaining traction at the moment and uh, will continue to do so. I think it's gonna be absolutely essential that how we join things together doesn't prevent the recyclability of our structures. And I can talk a little bit more with some examples on a later slide. 
Design certification is a big one that shouldn't be overlooked and I think needs to be included in, in future funded programmes. The um, challenge to doing things differently, uh, whatever the technology, but um, certainly in terms of joining things where you're taking load through a joint is, is essential that's done right. And um, there's a lot of work that needs to go into that. High rate is the next challenge. Um, there's lots of market opportunities in our future, but they're all high rate, whether it's urban air mobility or next single aisle, high rate is, uh, is the name of the game. And finally, quality. Um, both to achieve high rate and to be competitive, we need to achieve high quality. So how are we going to uh, achieve all of those things? First of all, um, I'll, I'll just outline our GKN Airframe approach to, to joining, or really more our GKN Airframe approach to technology. So we're split into four different clusters, which are represented by the four boxes here. So we've got a cluster around composite structures, um, a cluster around metallic structures, which includes additive manufacturing, a cluster around wiring systems, and a cluster around, predominantly around assembly, which is the cluster that I run. So we really, um, if you look at the right-hand side of this slide, you can see that we start with process-focused technologies, typically, um, or, or product focus, but the, 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 the focus is really in the detail. So if you're doing a joining process around metals, it would start in the metal structures cluster. If that is then applied on assembly, it would be taken into the assembly um, cluster as a, as a proven process. And that's where it's then automated. So we have a strong focus around automation in my own team. Um, before being pushed onto industrialization for specific applications. So from our perspective, um, funding around each phase of that up until the, the MPI project, which goes beyond automation, is also essential. From left to right, what you also see is a few examples of joining that actually exist within the, the, the discrete um, clusters, as they're shown here. So within Composite Structures um, cluster, there are processes such as preform integration, thermoplastic welding and systems integration, which form a part of, of that cluster. So even within the detailed part manufacture, joining comes into it strongly. So I think, you know, without going through every single line item on this slide, I think you can see that joining is pretty um, central to everything we do. And therefore having a structure or rather a strategy around it, I think makes a lot of sense. So finally, I'm going to end on some examples of development areas that we are either working on or have in our roadmap to work on. Um, so weight reduction, as I mentioned before, we're doing that through integrated composite structures. So a good example is the Wing of Tomorrow ATI funded project. Um, but we need to, to go further than that. We need to look at reduction of fasteners elsewhere. And um, we, we can do that through things such as friction stir spot welding, for example. Um, and, and bonding, adhesive bonding. If I look onto recyclability, then again, reduction of fasteners is a, is a key priority. And, and that really is around composite structures where it's hard to recycle them if you've got um, fasteners that have to be removed first. Um, if, if you've got a bonded composite assembly, you could actually grind up the, uh, the structure and recycle it and, and end up with a product that uh, could be used for a lower grade application. Um, whereas if you've got fasteners in there, it's, it's cost prohibitive to recycle that structure. Uh, design for disassembly, uh, I think it was briefly mentioned earlier, something that's new to us. Um, we need to, to do some work on what that really means. Um, but um, we've been looking at things that, that help re recyclability as well, like interlocking features. So determinate assembly, but not just hold to hold determinate assembly. We're looking at how we can bring in uh, features, particularly to... Um, essentially attach wiring harnesses to structures um, and, and also meet rates and other requirements. Design and certification. So the key R&D priority around that is design handbooks, but also generating the statistical data to actually produce those handbooks, whether it's performance data of different materials or process data to understand and really master the process inputs. It needs a lot of attention. Um, so in terms of generating um, programs that, that or funded programs, allowables generation needs to be included and has been uh, absent from some previously. Um, this is essential to, to give the tools to the design department that they need. 
Moving on to high rate and rate scalability, um, the R&D priority here is, is things such as in-process inspection, um, as well as automation of processes. So in-process inspection, depending on what you're trying to inspect, there's a whole plethora of different opportunities there to improve on the inspection, um, remove noise, and then process the data that you acquire as well. So real-time data analytics, feeding the results back into the process as well is a big opportunity there. Quality-wise, um, again, similar really to, to the others, we've got in-process inspection and um, in particular joint inspection. So this is all about joining. Inspecting the joint where it's an adhesively bonded joint, as an example, is, is traditionally very, very difficult and needs further development and should be, I think, named in particular as an area of, of special focus. So that brings me to a close um, for, for my section today. And uh, I'm moving back to Matt. Thank you, Andy. Um, and hello again, everyone. So I'm just going to go through some sort of final remarks before we move on to our Q&A. So the first thing to bring your attention to is the fact that the roadmap um, and executive summary document are now available to download from the ATI website. Um, so I welcome you to download those um, and, and absolutely uh, review these, uh, understand them, um, and then actually come and, come and discuss uh, these roadmaps with us. So we look forward to you getting in touch with us. We look forward to discussions uh, about the roadmap stimulating the debate, but then also how we can talk about addressing some of these challenges and bringing together the, the projects and consortia that can address these address these uh, joining technology uh, challenges and, and then enable uh, some of those uh, technology strands I was talking about earlier. Um, I will say this a few times, um, but you know, I'd, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone that's been supporting the strategy. Um, so in terms of the organizations we consulted, um, all of the people that have, have helped support putting this webinar together this morning, and also to, to Joao and, and Rob from TWI for, for really bringing together the, the roadmap document itself. So before we move on to the Q&A, so just some other things just to highlight. So perhaps the most important thing that a lot of you are interested to know about is, is the ATI um, competition um, uh, calendar. Um, so, as many of you know, uh, the ATI has recently reopened the, the program and to, to, to new competition calls. Um, and so, to bring your attention, uh, there'll be three expression of interest calls over the next couple of months. So, there'll be a call in June, July, and August, and that will lead then to a, a full stage application uh, later in the year. Um, but I'd also like to draw your attention to the NATEP program. Uh, which is uh, a program sort of more tailored towards SMEs. So there's a limit on a, on projects here of, of 300k uh, as a total cost. Um, there is a call currently open for the NATEP program, and that closes next week. Um, but there'll be further calls planned later this year and and, and early next year. Um, so all of these competitions can be accessed via the Innovate uh, UK IFS system. And the other bit then to bring your attention to is that we've got a pretty full uh, events calendar coming up. Um, so uh, if you haven't registered already, uh, please register for the uh, ATI uh, virtual event Destination Zero uh, on the 9th of June, which is free. It'd be another uh, webinar like this. Um, we've also got our conference plan, so that would be face-to-face, -face, um, and that's in November, and tickets are available to purchase for that now. Um, and uh, you know, again, glad to see that uh, Farnborough Air Show will be back uh, this year. Um, the ATI will have a, an, a, an exhibit there or a stand there, um, and we welcome you to come visit us and, and, and discuss the joining strategy amongst the other uh, sort of uh, areas of interest and priorities you may have. So that's uh, for the presentations. I'm now going to introduce my colleague, uh, Ben A. Membe, uh, who will be uh, leading us through our question and answer session. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ben A. Membe. I'm an advanced technologist at the ATI. And as Matt said, I'll be leading you through the Q&As. So just a quick reminder that we're using Slido for the Q&A, so please pop your questions in there. And um, without further ado, let's bring back our presenters. Um, we've got Matt, um, Rob, and Jal. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. It's great to see the ATI joining forces with TWI. So good job, uh, everyone. So I'm um, going to get started. And the first question is directed to you, Jal. Um, 
during the consultations, did you find significant differences in the priorities for different organizations or were they clear areas of common challenges that you found? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I, I believe there was commonality, especially because everyone was really um, conscious of the challenges imposed by transitioning to net zero. So um, I think uh, all of the stakeholders had a, uh, were in agreement that addressing the propulsion side of things was really essential, but also how you reduce the weight in structures to enable the, that that higher efficiency to be possible in the first place. So I think I think there was some some consensus there, and um, also there was agreement in ter- the the new markets that are about to to really arrive, like the urban air mobility segments. So we found some. Um, some good agreement there um and then there was where there was some some um well and where, where we had some unclear answers was really was how how new architectures will be shared so kind of how oems will lead technology development how much of that capability will be brought in house compared to uh, working with partners to actually work uh, having partners working and suppliers working as an extension of their r d so that really these new programs and the new types of aircraft that are coming. They introduce a really interesting opportunity for, for either integrating technology in-house or partnering up more closely. So I think that was an interesting area where we didn't really see much of a consensus yet. Okay, um, thank you very much. So we'll move on to the next question, which is a nice segue. So this, I'll direct this one to Rob. Um, from the different R&D priorities that you highlighted, where do you see the greatest technical challenges for the industry? Uh, thank you, Bennett. I think that the, the main uh, technical challenges is, uh, is sort of challenging the conventional. There's been quite a lot of, um, of aircraft product that's really used more conventional joining technologies. The obvious one is, is riveting. Um, and if you look at you know, Destination Zero and, and all of the, the uh, different areas that outline different challenges to, to, to go to net zero that, that, that are out there, it's, it's going to mean a, a step change in, in aircraft product as, as, you, as you go forward. And so, you know, the, the old things are, are not going to be good enough. You know, the, the old ways of, of joining things together, of welding things together. Um, as, we, as we adopt you know, new materials, new approaches to, to, uh, that, are, that are driven by, by this sort of the, this, the mega trend of, of, of net zero, Means that you know you, you're going to have to you know, really push the boundaries in terms of uh, you're developing your technologies for, for for welding slash joining as you go forward. So I think yeah the the, the main um, uh, issue will be sort of uh, you know, you know, thinking um, you know uh, in a more of a step change view you know, going more from conventional product that's been used for for a long time and actually you know trying to push forward and using different. Um, uh, you know, forms of joining. Obviously, it has to be horses for courses. You can't use electron beam welding for everything, for example. But um, but you know, it, it does have to be a, a very much an you know, open view in terms of, of how uh, joining methods are going to be used in the future. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Rob. Um, next question is for you, Matt. Um, so there's a lot of ideas that have been generated throughout this. Um, process of creating a strategy. And um, we've got a question here which wants to understand whether there's a prioritization of some of those technologies on the roadmaps in terms of which ones would get funded. Um, so thanks for that, Benny. Um, I mean, ultimately, uh, all of the technologies are a priority that you know we need to develop them. So if we look at the, the date destination zero strategy, we've got you know three very clear themes around the you know, the zero emission aircraft, the ultra efficient aircraft. Uh, so in all of these, this is really going to drive us in terms of our priorities. And the different joining technologies then will enable different things. So we saw that there's a clear challenge around the future propulsion um, and, uh, you know, whether that be electric propulsion or hydrogen propulsion. Um, you know, there's clear challenges around that and, and, that, and there's, there's topics that we need to, you know, to, to really progress on if we're going to, 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 to get closer to the, to the 2050 net zero targets. Similarly, on the structures, again, there's, there's areas there that then enable, um, uh, uh, you know, all of the different technologies in the ultra efficient, et cetera. Um, but, but there are also areas where actually that, you know, we can look at some of the priorities. Um, so perhaps the automation, the inspection, 
the repair that applies regardless of, of the of the application that they're, they're more generic technologies that we need to consider so i mean i appreciate i've not really answered the question it's a very difficult one because ultimately we need we need we need to develop in all of these technologies to be able to to achieve the overall uh, vision for 2050 for for the for the aerospace uh, sector and and to deliver on the ati strategy so it's, it's very difficult to prioritize it but but um, you know, there's there's no set prioritization, but but ultimately we want to deliver the ATI uh, destination zero strategy. So that that will be our that will be our aim through the projects that we're funding. All right. Um, thank you very much, Matt. I've um, got a question here, which I'll direct back to Jao. Um, and why did you focus on technology pool rather than both the pool and push approach? Oh, wow, you got me there. Thank you, Benny. Uh, yeah. So we. Yeah, so what I said there earlier is a, a bit of a simplification. So we did uh, start with the market pool because there were trends at the national level that we really needed to incorporate in this more technology focused roadmap. But we had to also understand what the offering was really for um, in the UK. So where the strengths were and how the sector was actually better placed to be competitive in the future. So we actually went for a bit of push um, based on understanding what the current capability and strengths. So we did a, a SWOT matrix to, to establish that. And we did kind of try to prioritize in the near term things where the UK was already very strong. And that includes uh, so the, 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 the trends on the electrification, but also the airframe and wing technology. So we did prioritize some, some of those aspects early on in the roadmap because we, we wanted to give the UK the best start possible into into developing and implementing the roadmap later. So I did simplify earlier. We did involve a bit of everything. All right. Um, thank you very much. I think we're almost um, up with time. We've got a minute or so left. So I'll call the calls to the Q&A session for now, and I'll just pass on um, to Matt um, to say the final conclusions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benet. So thank you for uh, thank you for uh, being our MC during our question and answer session. Um, so thank you to all of our um, participants in the webinar this morning. So thank you to uh, Rob Scudamore and Gerald Gander from TWI. Thank you to Richard March from uh, Rolls Royce and to Andy Portsmore from GK and Aerospace. Um, and finally, you know, really thank you to everyone that supported the consultation. Um, all of the organizations that we spoke to. Um, thank you to everybody who's joined us this morning uh, for the launch of this strategy. And really, you know, to, to, to conclude on this, what I'd like to say is that, you know, please go to our website, please download the roadmap and the executive summary report. Um, please read it, review it, and, and then, you know, get in touch and, and let's, have, let's have those discussions and dialogues about how we, how we drive forward the technology development that, that we've identified um let's have some debate around it because we, we you know we might not be entirely right um but yeah let's let's work together um and and ultimately let's uh you know let's do this for the success of, of the uk aerospace industry so you know one final thank you to everybody that's been involved um and i wish you all a uh, a nice rest of your day and thank you very much for your time <laughs>